the book of uh, Act chapter 6, 1 to 7, in Jesus' name. In, this, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on the, uh, the tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and the wisdom. We will turn this uh, resp responsibility off over to them and will give our attention to prayers and the ministry of the world. This problem, uh, this proposal placed the whole groups. They choose Stephen, man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Procross, Nicanor, Timot, um, Permanent, and uh, Nicholas from Antucho, <laughs> convert to uh, Ju Judaism. They, pro they presented this man to the, pro um, the, the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased repeatedly and, the, and a large number of priests because of, um, because obeying, um, obeying it to the faith. I, I did not take the Bible back to Abraham. I took it to someone else who gave it to Abraham and said he needed to read it. So, Abraham, thank you so much. You did very, very well. And I love your accent so much. This morning's message is entitled, A Collaborative, Respo or a Collaborative Process for Shared Mission. And I've got to tell you that I'm just a little enthused about this morning. And the reason is for what God's going to teach us, but also um, because this morning is going to be an expositional message instead of just a topical message. There's only seven verses, so I think we can get through them. Um, and I'm going to use an old, well-known outline of this, this passage that I've modified, hopefully, to be a little more relevant. So in the narrative story that we just read from Acts 6, 1 to 7, there was, if you look on the screen, there was a big problem. A big problem. But the church was able to respond well because they had some great priorities. And together they came up with an excellent plan. And there was exceptional group participation. And because of this collaborative process, things went up and to the right. And the result was progress progress. We read that the word of God spread and disciples multiplied. And our time this morning is going to conclude with a Kitchener-Waterloo specific call to action. A call to action for us here in KW. So first of all, what was the problem? Well, it's in verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, wait, that does not sound like a problem. Right? Isn't that interesting that he's about to introduce this big problem, but, but, but it doesn't sound like this is a bad thing. The disciple-making that happened in Acts 2 was continuing. Why was it continuing? Because there, there was a white-hot focus on gospel mission. I, I, I don't want to jump ahead, but, but this 
was the church's priority, gospel mission. And it seems that Peter's spiritual children from Acts 2 and Acts 3 are now having children of their own, so to speak. And the numbers are increasing. Now, who thinks that when good things like this are happening, that everything should be calm, water, smooth sailing all the time? No, life doesn't go that way, right? When things start sailing smoothly, all of a sudden something happens. And, 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 and here, things got messy. They got messy. So what happened? Here's the problem. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. First of all, what? Complaining in the church? Shocking. Isn't that shocking for anyone? Okay, only a few of us are smiling. Even behind your mask, I can tell. God's word is slightly more relevant than we might have imagined. In context... Again, good things are happening, and everyone should be happy, but they're not. Why? Well, there are actually a couple of reasons. And this is the crux of the problem. So number one, a group of people's needs, let's call them group A. Group A's needs are not being met. Reason number two, and I call this the drill down reason. This is the real reason. Group B has the same needs as group A, but group B's are being met. So group A and B both have the same needs. Group A's needs are being met, groups B's are not. And to illustrate what that might feel like, I need a couple of volunteers. Brian, please, and one other volunteer. Yeah, everyone look down so I don't pick you. But <laughs> Karen, please. Okay, would you two mind standing? You can stay distanced from each other, but we will need this microphone. Okay, so here's what we need. You're both imagining you're thirsty, and you've heard this like um, dying of thirst, the idea of dying of thirst. Could you sort of give us what that would look like, like you're dying of thirst? Okay, good. <coughs> oh, amazing. <coughs> Honestly, did I ask either of you ahead of time? To see, I knew these would be great actors, so. Okay, um, so we care about you. We pray for you and love you and so on, so I want to meet your needs. And so I have a couple of drinks of water here. And uh, yeah, so, so Karen, here you go, there. Go, go ahead and you can start drinking it. Hope you, hope you enjoy it. And actually, you know what? We haven't had a lot of in-person fellowship, so Karen, I'll join you. I'll, I'll have some, too. I'll have some. Can't really share, you know, it's because COVID and all. So, Karen, feel free to just take that with you and finish that up. Thanks. Can everyone give them a hand, please? Oh, yeah. Real nice. Yeah. There'll be parting gifts for Brian, maybe, later. <laughs> See we, see, see, we don't believe that's okay, right? That's not okay. It's about inequity. It's about unfairness. It's possibly about favoritism. I mean, in that case, for sure it was. <laughs> you know, but you know what God's Spirit doesn't do here? He doesn't get after the complainers. He doesn't call them out for their complaining. Now, does it justify complaining? Some of you are saying, if it does, I'm making this one of my life verses, right? It'll give me the right to complain. You need salvation. You need Jesus for real, okay, if that's your attitude. No, it doesn't justify complaining. In fact, God has spoken, and he didn't stutter on this topic. Listen to Philippians 2.14. Do everything, not some things. Do everything, how? Without complaining and arguing. That might be one of the bigger sins in the North American church, complaining. Bringing needs to the attention of those who can help out, absolutely. That's not complaining. It's about how we surface a problem. Do we gongusmas? Doesn't that sound like a terrible word? That's the word for complaining, gongusmas. It's also, also translated grumbling, grumble, grumble. It's a great word. It's the same word used in Jude, verse 16, where it says, these people are gongusmas, they're grumblers and fault finders. 
They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves. Who knew that self was lurking in the shadows behind grumbling and complaining? And so is Satan. So is Satan. It's his number one plan of attack, divide and conquer. And that's what he's trying to do in the church here. And complaining is one of the tools in his hands. Well, who are these two groups of people? I think we need to understand that. If you look in the screen, the Hellenistic Jews were Greek cultured and Greek speaking. So they likely did not grow up in Jerusalem. They grew up in the Roman world, but they're Hebrews, they're, they're Jewish. The Hebraic Jews were raised in Jerusalem. They're Aramaic speaking. So they're different languages, different cultures, even though Jewish. And what I'm describing here are, are two camps of Jewish people in the culture outside the church. And what happened? Well, what almost always happens, tribalism. Tribalism. Isn't that a problem all over the globe to this day? But sadly, what was happening in the world found its way into the local church. And it expressed itself. Now, we're not told this explicitly, but it would appear that it expressed itself as favoritism. It might have been unintentional, but the word overlooked, also translated neglected in some translations, it just smells fishy, doesn't it? It, it smells like the play, we, the little skit we just did. One is overlooked, one is, is served. Well, the Hellenistic Jews, I think they were justified. Uh, they, they may have gone about it the wrong way in their complaining, but here we are. And what is the church going to do? So back to our outline. They have a big problem, but they have some bigger priorities. Some bigger priorities. And what were their priorities? And again, remember, this is the church we're talking about who is the beginnings of who we are as the church. What we're reading may be historical description from Acts 6, but no doubt about it, it is doctrinal prescription for us today. So here's one of their priorities. The church would not be divided by a problem. They just wouldn't allow it to happen. We will not be divided by a problem. Why? Because the church was united by a priority and a passion. And what was that priority and passion? It was the kingdom of God matters more than anything else. Not the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of God. The gospel, the good news of Jesus mattered more. And the souls of men, women, boys and girls was at stake. The person of Jesus and the way of Jesus was on the line. I heard this quote once, a church with internal conflict has a buried message. A buried message. Disunity hinders our ability to proclaim the gospel to our society. May it never be. If you look in the screen, that's a friendly face. John Stott was a beloved theologian, educator, and author, and he went home just about 10 years ago to heaven. But he said this, we cannot proclaim the gospel of God's love with any degree of integrity if we don't exhibit it in our love for others. Notice this, nothing is so damaging to the cause of Christ as a church that is torn apart by jealousy, rivalry, slander, and malice, or preoccupied with its own selfish concerns. However, this Acts 6 church, they focused on their priorities, and they resolved the problem as soon as possible. So, besides gospel mission, what were their priorities? I see a couple of them right here in the text. Verse 2. So the 12, the 12 apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, so here's a priority. Here's a priority. We're in this together. We're in this together. Everyone is on board. This was not just the mission of the few. This was not just the mission of the gifted. It was not just the mission of the leaders. They gathered everyone who called themselves a disciple of Jesus together. We're all a part of the mission. Secondly, in addition to the priority of the gospel was the priority of giftedness. 
Look what it says. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, could the 12 apostles have met the need? Sure they could have. And they weren't above serving in this way. Some accuse them of that. They, they, they weren't. But their gifting was to serve by teaching God's word. Others had the gift to serve practically by physically distributing food. So the priority was everyone serving and let's have people serving in their gifting. If you know Jesus, if you've invited him to be the king of your life and the savior of your soul, do you know that you have a spiritual gift? Or two, or three, or five? Do you know your spiritual gifts? And are you using them? Are you using them? Now, I do want to say this. It's almost like a timeout. Um, there is a really important aside here. Many churches and a large number of Christian-based institutions and schools that were originally gospel-centered have neglected the word of God to wait on tables. Anything wrong with serving people at tables in need? Nothing. Is there something wrong with leaving the word of God and neglecting to convey the whole counsel of God? Everything is wrong with that. Everything is wrong with that. It's called a social gospel. Again, the perils of extreme, of extremes, it's not either or, it's both and. Word of God, wait on tables. Word of God, wait on tables. Both, right there in the text. See, the corollary to this is that some churches are all about the word and no serving tables. That is equally wrong. Unbiblical. Not God's heart for this world. I mean, again, just read his word. Christians only doing Bible studies is not God's heart for them or for the world. Word of God, wait on tables. Word of God, wait on tables. You know, when we serve people in need, bigger picture, what is happening? What is happening? First of all, the people being served experience Jesus. Sometimes, even before they hear about him, they experience him. If you're a spirit-led follower of Jesus, it is Jesus serving others through you. Through you. Secondly, also big picture, when we serve others, we are serving Jesus. We are serving Jesus. That's what he said. I'm quoting Jesus. If you look on the screen, Matthew 25, verse 40, he said, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I have always enjoyed, and like the story from the time I heard it years ago, of an old, elderly um, uh, shoe cobbler. That's a shoe repairman back in the day. And he had this vivid dream through the night that Jesus was going to come and visit him the very next day. And it was so real that when he woke up, he, he expected it. Wouldn't that be amazing if every day we expected to encounter Jesus? And so he did. And so he, he went from his living space out to the front where his shop was, and, his, and he's waiting for people to come in. And after the day you know, went on, an a elderly man came in just seeking warmth. But he noticed that the, the fellow had holes in his shoes and he had bruises on his feet. And so he went and he got him a brand new pair of, of shoes and he gave them to him. Then after a while in the day, an elderly woman came along and she said, would you have any money? I'm very hungry. She, she, he said, I can do something better. And he went back and he asked his wife, would you prepare a meal for this woman? And he brought her a meal and she went on her way. And then after a while later in the day, he heard a, a, a little boy crying just outside his his front door, and he went out, and he said, what's, what's wrong, lad? And, and he said, I, I'm lost. I can't find my parents. And, and he helped the boy find his parents. And finally, it was the end of the day, and he closed the shop, and he went on his knees, and he said, Lord, I, I sincerely expected you to come, and you didn't come. And he felt the Lord say to him, three times I knocked on your door today, and three times you answered and welcomed me. I was the man with the bruised feet. I was the woman you gave something to eat. I was the lost boy out on the street. 
Mother Teresa once was asked, how do you see the face and hand of God in everything the way you do? And she replied, here's what she said, I see and adore the presence of Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor. In the distressing disguise of the poor. Um, Through our son Jay, who writes books, he was mentored by an author and pastor uh, and seminary prof named Mark Buchanan. And so we've gotten to know Mark. And uh, he actually has an addition, or, or sorry, a, a, a commentary in this, this particular Bible. But this is what he says, Mark says, my friend Jim Simbola, maybe you've heard of him, Brooklyn Tabernacle. Uh, Mark, do you know what the number one sin of the church in North America is? It's not the plague of internet pornography that is consuming our men. It's not that the divorce rate of the church is roughly the same as society at large. The number one sin of the church in North America is that its pastors and leaders are not on their knees crying out to God, bring us the drug addicted, bring us the prostituted women, bring us the destitute, bring us the gang leaders, bring us those with AIDS, bring us the people nobody else wants, whom only you can heal, and let us love them in your name until they are whole. And Mark says, I had no response. I was undone. I had never prayed, not once, for God to bring such people to my church. I went home and repented. I began to cry out for those nobody wanted, and God brought them. I found out why nobody wants them. They're messy and costly and dirty. They swear at me. They lie to you. They steal from you. Worse, they make you love them, and then they often break their heart, your heart. And he goes on and he talks about that. And our son Jay and and his wife Michelle, they got to see this up front and and personal for six months when they were uh, being mentored by Mark and the the huge ministry that they had to uh, First Nations people on a reserve on Vancouver Island because of that prayer. May that become our prayer. May that become our prayer. Serving those in need at the table is God's demonstration of love, sometimes before people hear a declaration of his love. And and some don't have ears to hear about the love of God until they experience the love of God. And they need both. We need both. Well, before the next point, and I'm going to get to the third point quickly, but why do priorities matter? This is really important because our priorities are the why behind the what. Why are we doing what we're doing? We we should always work out the why before the what. Because the why frames the what. If mission to people matters, then we get organized around mission. Notice how important it is to the apostles. Look at the word they actually say. It would not be right. It would not be acceptable. It would not be satisfactory for us to neglect something, to do something else. There's a big why behind the what of what they're doing. Well, they had a problem, but they had some great priorities. But thirdly, they came up with an excellent plan. And by the way, just as an aside, they didn't form a committee or a team to plan to talk about it, they presumably prayed about it, talked about it, and came up with a plan. And what was the plan? Well, here it is, verse 3 and 4. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the, the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the world, the Word. Now, many believe that what we have here in Acts 6 in practice is what we have in 1 Timothy 3 in principle. In 1 Timothy 3, we're given a list of qualities, character qualities, behavioral qualities, required by people whom God's Spirit gives one of the coolest names in the Bible. You say, really? Yes, really. One of the coolest names in the Bible. The word is diakonoi, (laughs) And the root word is diakonos. You say, it doesn't sound really cool to me yet. Okay, we're we're, going to get there. First of all, when the English translators came to this word, diakonos, they just looked at each other. 
do we know any word like this? I mean, we can parse out what it means, but what is diakonos? And so they said, well, diakonos sounds like deacon, let's call it that. So the English word is deacon. It's what's called a transliterated word. There's many words like this in the Bible. They came to the word baptizo. Didn't know exactly how to translate it, so they call it baptize. So lots of translator, transliterated words. Why is it one of the coolest names? Here's why. Of the 29 times that diakonos in its variations appears in the New Testament, only three times is it actually translated deacon. Seven times it's translated minister, but 19 of the 29 times, servant. So when you read the word servant in the New Testament, often it's diakonos. You say, still not cool. Still not cool. We're, we're, we're going to get there. So here's where it comes from. Dia means because of or on account of, and konos means dust. Do you know what? Dika... Uh, diakonos means. It means dust stirred up because of movement. What is a servant? A servant is someone who moves so quickly that they stir up dust because of movement. Isn't that cool? I'm the only one. Okay. Now, some of you are saying, shouldn't they be cleaning up the dust if they're servants? Just go with the imagery, okay? They're moving so fast. Hey, are you raising dust? Are you serving in such a way that you're raising dust. You're a servant. Get after it if you are. So here in verse 3 and 4, they're following their gifting priorities. Servants doing what they do best, serving the community. Leaders, teachers doing what they do best, praying, teaching, and leading the community. Each set apart by God through a calling and gifting from him. Notice though who is responsible. I've underlined it here. We say the apostles we'll turn this responsibility over to them. The apostles, who are the precursors of the elders in the church, are given the visional and directional responsibility and authority from God. That's not a power play. That's not a position thing. It's an issue of humble obedience to the God-given line of authority in the local church. But also notice this about their plan. I think this is fascinating. He says, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. Serving Jesus, sorry, serving in Jesus' name requires God's Spirit and God's wisdom no less than teaching the Word of God does. Without Him, we can do what? Nothing. No matter what we're doing. We can do nothing without him. Known to be full of the spirit. That's, that's spiritual mindedness. Known to be full of wisdom. That's practical mindedness. Right? Spiritually minded, practically minded. Both are so important. Have you ever heard this expression? That person was so heavenly minded, there were no earthly good. Well, that's not good. And then some are so focused on earthly things, they're not really spiritually minded. The balance here, not one or the other, but both and, and then we'll be effective. All right, the problem, their priorities, a great plan. There was then exceptional participation. Notice verse 5. First, the proposal pleased the whole group. Nice to see that unity, right? It pleased the whole group. Secondly, the group participated by choosing they chose these seven fellows. And uh, who did they choose? They choose, chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And, and from verse 8 right through the end of chapter 7, we're going to learn a lot about Stephen. And, and also Philip, which we read about in the New Testament as well, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Ju Judaism. Who are these fellows? Well, besides the best boy baby names of 2022, if you're looking for a baby name for your kid, these, it's a good list. Uh, notice God's wisdom. Notice God's wisdom in their selection. They are all Greek names. They're serving Hellenistic Greek culture Jewish widows, and they felt God's wisdom would be to choose Hellenistic Jewish people to serve them. That's interesting. 
And then verse 6 demonstrates yet another step of group participation. Look what they did. The church presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Again, God's line of blessing through God's line of authority. From God, down through the, the apostolic leaders, to these seven servants that God would use them in the mission. Well, let's get to the last point. We have a problem. They have great priorities, a great plan, wonderful participation. What's the result? Progress. What happened? It's in verse 7. This is astounding, really. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. But look at this last part. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Whoa. Did not see that last piece of good news coming. That many of the priests from the temple came to faith. That's amazing. And these results are all God. We plant, we water, but only God can make it grow. Well, is it possible that God would invite us into this collaborative process for a shared mission right here in Kitchener-Waterloo? There is a problem right here in KW, and I'm not embellishing, I'm not being humorous, this is serious, folks. We, there is a problem here in Kitchener-Waterloo, and it involves some precious followers of Jesus, disciples of Christ, who are being neglected. I know it's unintentional. But once we find out about it, we will be responsible. With the same priorities as the Acts 6 church of the gospel, and everyone serving through giftedness, we need a plan for maximized participation. You say, what's the problem? Well, there is a neighborhood very near to where we are at this moment. Those in person here at Grace, it's near this space. And in that neighborhood, there are not just a few, there are many moms with one, two, three, four children or more and dad's not around. Dad is not around for a variety of reasons, and some of them involve it being more safe for mom and kids to not have dad around. And these moms, as I mentioned, have become followers of Jesus. And they are trying to provide for their children, both what they need physically and what they need spiritually. You say, Gord, how do you know this? Well, it's not just because our brother and sister who are here this morning, and this message goes out on social media, so I'm not naming names, but it's not just that our brother and sister have told us stories. Some of us have been meeting for a number of months in our brother and sister's neighborhood and in these moms' homes for prayer and conversation, and we have heard some of their stories. And it's not my story to tell their stories. But some have, have, have said that they will, in future Sundays, they're, they're willing to tell their stories. And we need to hear them. But these families need our help. If you look on the screen, they need our prayers. And you say, well, I don't know what to pray about. Well, then let's put together a team who can learn what those prayer needs are so that we can pray about them. And they need Christian community. They need Christian community. And disciple-making has happened, but what they need now is disciple-maturing. Someone to walk with them in their newfound faith in Jesus. And what they really need, too, is support. Ongoing support. And what might that look like? Well, weekly help with practical needs. They need and would love mentoring as moms they need help with their kids. They could really be blessed with some babysitting. While mom is doing ESL, online for now, in person later, someone watching their kids, or, or if mom just needs to go out, to go shopping or elsewhere, without a group of kiddos in tow. And they need, they have needs financially, grocery store gift cards, and, and etc. 
Why? Just so they know that beyond a shadow of doubt that they are our sisters and that the mission field of their families that matters to them matters to us. And so that they know that they are cared for. If we select seven Greek, English, Eritrean, Scottish, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what nationality. Just seven, 10, 20 people filled with God's spirit and wisdom to do this. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll bless those seven or 10 or 20 and we'll pray for them and we'll release them to serve. And God will make it grow into something beyond what we can ask or imagine. And that's progress. That's progress. Let's pray. Spirit of God, just breathe through your word what you're calling us to do. Calling us first to be and then to do. God, may we all scatter from this place of gathering together and get alone with you and cry out to you. Here am I, Lord. Send me. God, by your spirit, enable us to respond in a way that sees the word of God spread, disciples multiplied, and even people we hadn't even prayed for to come to know Jesus. Lord, may all of this bring glory and honor to the one who is worthy, Jesus Christ, our King. We pray in his name. Amen.